So first of all, I want to start by acknowledging all the different entities that have played one role in this project one way or another. Since the creation of the Puerto Rico Coral Reef Monitoring Program back in 1999, to all the, uh, the fieldwork implemented, to uh, the data management, translation, and finally the archival and the, uh, the transfer of that data into a visualization application, this job has been possible with a lot of partners and a lot of people that, uh, individuals that have put a little bit of their uh, effort to make this happen. So I just want to acknowledge that. And it's from the public sector and also from the private sector, uh, the fieldwork team, which is composed of Reef Research Inc. and Coastal Survey Solutions, who have um, worked very intensely in the field to be able to get this data, you know, even risking their lives sometimes. So really, uh, I just wanted to thank you all. And to Axiom Data Science, who has been a really important player in this process, as you're going to learn later in this presentation. So today, uh, first of all, uh, as for an agenda, we'll be giving a brief overview of the Puerto Rico Coral Reef Monitoring Program, so a little bit of, of the data that is available and the products that you can also get uh, online. Then I'll, I'll be providing some insights on the process to translate to the Darwin Core Standard, uh, the, the database from the PR Prem. And then we're gonna enter in full of, uh, to the demo of this layer, first showing the main layers of the PR Prem that are available in the Embo application. We'll be doing a demonstration of uh, some data visual, visuals and extraction. And then we'll be uh, talking a little bit of what are next steps that we are hoping to, to address in the near, uh, in the upcoming months, and then uh, move uh, end with a questions and answers session. Okay. So the PR Crem, the Puerto Rico Coral Reef Monitoring Program, it's been a joint effort uh, between NOAA's Coral Reef Conservation Program and the Puerto Rico Department of Natural and Environmental Resources since 1999. It's a joint effort part of a collaborative agreement between the two entities. And the main objectives of this monitoring program is to know the conditions of coral reef species with high ecological and economic importance, identify the trends of these communities in response to environmental and anthropogenic drivers of change, and determine the most effective man management strategies for the protection of reef resources in Puerto Rico. So really this monitoring program serves as a very uh, a key tool for what is the Puerto Rico Coral Reef Conservation and Management Program, because it provides biological data for decision makers to evaluate what's the condition of the reefs and what are some of potential management strategies that can be uh, implemented. So over the last two decades, more than 80 stations around Puerto Rico have been visited, some of them for various years. Most of these stations are within polygons of marine protected areas in the Puerto Rican archipelago. Nowadays, is, since 2015 to present, we have currently 42 stations that are surveyed every two years. 62% of these 42 stations are within MPAs. And right now, the Puerto Rico uh, Coral Reef Conservation and Management Program is requesting to add uh, three more stations in Mona Island, which is located in the western part of the archipelago, to expand the, the total of currently permanent uh, monitored stations to 45. There are several data sets that uh, this program uh, produces, which capture uh, the benthic and the fish communities of coral reefs in Puerto Rico. In the data sets, we're going to find uh, data on rugosity, which is a measure of topographic complexity, complexity of our reefs. This is measured as the total chain length that is overlaid over the reef bottom minus the total linear length of that transect. It is expressed in, in units of meters, and there's five replicates of rugosity measurements per monitoring station. The benthic sessile community is assessed in terms of cover percentage as the metric of abundance, 
There's there are also um, counts of octocoral colon colonies and disease prevalence in these uh, benthic transects. And the sample unit here is also a 10 meter chain transect and there's five replicates per site. The fish and micro macroinvertebrate communities or assemblages are uh, characterized in terms of density as number of individuals. And the sample units have been uh, belt transects of 10 meters long by three meters wide. There's also five transect replicates per site. Now, a subset of species of fish and macro, ma macro invertebrates that are of economic and ecological importance are characterized as well in, in, a, in terms of density, but in a larger version of the 20 by 3 meter transect. So since 1999 to 2013, these uh, uh, commercially important species were assessed in an active search census for 30 minutes. But then this method was adapted and it was changed to uh, an extended version of the 30 meter square transect. So now it's a 20 by three meter uh, bell transect. So we're getting number of individuals per 60 meters square. Now a subset of, of those commercially important species which have length weight relationship data available, we have been able to calculate biomass for those because in the, in the previous uh, transect units, also sizes are estimated for each individual. So with the amount of individuals and the, and the estimated size of those individuals, we, we were able to calculate biomass. So we have a biomass matrix uh, for, for a, a subset of about 64 species of commercially important fish. Um, in terms of products, there's been several uh, peer review publications available in the scientific literature, um, mostly uh, led by Dr. Reni Garcia uh, fieldwork team. And there's at least two uh, uh, graduate research theses that have been uh, a product of this monitoring program. In addition, if you go to the DNER CODAL program website under the Monitoreo tab, you can find a list of annual uh, reports from the peer CREM. These reports are provided in PDF and provide more information and a synthesis of what are the main results and some of the trends in, in these stations that are monitored every two years. If you would like to dive into the data itself, you can go to the NOAA's National Center for Environmental Information and uh, maybe this is more accessible through CORIS, which stands for the Coral Reef Information System of NOAA's CRCP. And from there, you can uh, download the data, metadata, methods, uh, data dictionary, and, and such. There's a YouTube video on how to download this data from NCI, because sometimes it's a little bit tricky. Unfortunately, it's only in Spanish right now. So if you would like to see a video, uh, that video translated to English, please, you can let me know. And most recently, we have uh, archived the data as well into the uh, OBIS archive and the Global Biodiversity Information Facility, GBIF. So you can find the data there as well. I'm gonna allow in a couple of people that enter late. So if you give me one second, let me see if there's anybody else waiting. No, I think that's it. Okay. Back to the presentation. Sorry. Oh, there we go. Yes, uh, sorry for that interruption. Uh, there were some people waiting in line that tried to join afterwards. Okay. So moving on from the data and products, now I'm gonna talk a little bit on, the, on my insights of how was this process of translating our original uh, peer cream database into the Darwin Core standard. And this process was needed because this uh, archive that we have in, in NCEI, in, in the National Center for Environmental Information, 
is in a different format than the data archive in Obis. And yeah, it seems like double the work, but um, the project that first worked toward compiling all the raw data from the PR creme was designed for a specific resilience assessment That's what, that was um, proposed by Dr. Juan Cruz Mota from the University of Puerto Rico. So he was um, compiling the data to make a synthesized product out of it. And so he compiled it in a specific format, which was not necessarily compatible with the Darwin Core standard. So we had, uh, with support from CARICUS, uh, which uh, had a, a, a need to have to reinforce biological observations of marine data in Puerto Rico and the Caribbean, we then worked together uh, with Noah Ayos to actually translate that whole database into following the Darwin Core Standard, which is a standardized format that allows biological and biodiversity data sets to integrate into global uh, repositories of data, which I think is, is a really important um, perspective that people collecting data in the field should have so their data can be integrated into regional and global data models, for example. So this process uh, started by the, well, the translation, right? We need to produce three uh, matrices out of our main uh, data set from the PR creme. And these are the event, the occurrence, and the measurement CSV files that we had to produce. Then, or at the same time, this had to be revised uh, constantly by staff from OBIS USA and MBON POCs. Because uh, for us, and for me specifically, this was the first time I never had experience working with Darwin Core. So uh, for me, it was really like discovering my path into um, archiving this data in, in, in a standardized format, right? Finally, after uh, all these revisions, we then submitted uh, the translated database to OBIS USA. And um, from there, once it's, it's in, in OBIS, it can actually be fed into a data visualization application that is run in the Mbond Mbon data portal. So it's kind of like first translate, then archive in OBIS, and then it can be pulled into um, uh, data visualization applications like, like the Embon Data Portal. And I recently discovered that there's also an application being developed in Mexico called CIMAR, who is also pulling data from OBIS. So there's a benefit that if your data is in, OB, in the OBIS archive following the Darwin Core Standard, it can actually be pulled by different um, applications that are being developed um, in the web. I wanted to highlight in this process as well that for us it was key to have a guiding example and for this uh, the Florida Coral Reef Ecosystem Monitoring Project was key because it already had a layer in Embon of Coral Reef um, benthic data which was on the same line of our peer cream database and that was something that we were able to use as as a example or when we were trying to define a wish list, these are kind of like the visual and the features that we would like uh, the PR Crane data set to have. So that was really, really helpful. And it was already in the Mbon data portal when we started. Also the collaboration, as I mentioned, between Caricus and Noah Ayos really complemented the efforts that the uh, DRNA is, is implementing with, with the fieldwork contractors. Uh, USGS provided key support in the revision of these uh, matrices for the uh, Darwin Core database that we were making. So um, I want to shout out to Abigail Benson from USGS, who is working with Obis USA, who really uh, gave us a lot of attention and really worked us and took us by the hand, literally, uh, while we were, you know, just trying to find our path through this uh, maze of translation. And finally, Ax Axiom Data Science, who are the ones that are um, programming and, and updating these uh, data visual visualization applications. So they were also very supportive 
and they understood that uh, if we, even though we didn't understand much about how this data gets ingested and such, they were very understanding and, and helped us, help them understand uh, what, what the database and the data set is about and how to better visualize it. So these three matrices, to give a, a brief uh, description of what, what they, they're based on. First, the event file will uh, compile all your temporal and spatial information, metadata from your design. So things like temporal and spatial factors, they will be um, captured in the event uh, file. Your sample event IDs, your geospatial me uh, metadata, habitat information, references and credits of your database, all, those, all that information gets compiled into event CSV. Now this, this matrix has a unique identifier called the event ID, which allows this file to communicate with the occurrence file. In the occurrence file is where you basically have the biological variables with all their taxonomic information in a standardized way following you know, the most recent updated uh, taxonomic information available in worms. Uh, so pretty straightforward, right? Then uh, this occurrence file has an ID as well, a unique identifier for every row in that matrix that will communicate that file with the last file, which is the measurements file. And this is where you compile your values, like what are the measurements that characterize or quantify those biological communities what types of measurement they are, what are units and what methods you're using uh, to collect that data. So it's three files, one database, and these three files are communicating with each other. Yeah, if you want to start your own translation, you can also check the Darwin Core Quick Reference Guide, which for us, it was really, really helpful. And you can pick from there what terms better adapt to your database. Now, beware that there's some Darwin Core terms that are required in order to submit a, a Darwin Core database to, to always. So now, uh, if you go to the MBON data portal, you can go to search data sets and you can just type in the peer cramp and you'll see that it comes up really easily to find. And there's two layers associated to those keywords. There's the occurrence and coverage layer of the Puerto Rico Coral Monitoring Program and there's a layer for reef rugosity. If you click on one of those layers, the portal will take you to like a meta data uh, view of those layers where you have recognition of, you know, the credits, the, the data description, data abstract. And then you see a list of what are the measurements that are included in that, in that layer. As you can see, we have the density data, colonies per transect, cover percentage, uh, the grams per minutes, grams per uh, 60 meters squares. This is uh, grams for, for the biomass uh, data sets and also counts, counts per minutes, given the active search census that was implemented before 2015. And you see other information that we're gonna go uh, over later. And the other layer, which is the reef rugosity, is just a layer with the mean rugosity measurement uh, showing what, what is the topographic complexity of these stations where biological data is being collected. So how do you add these layers to the map? If you check the layers, there's a button that says add to the map. You just click it and the layers are automatically added to, to the map that you can go into the upper tab right there and you see uh, the map view. On the right panel, you'll see the layers that you have selected and you can select as many layers as you want. Um, for example, there we have the occurrence and coverage and the refugosity layer. You can grab them and uh, move them around to rearrange them in the order that you like. You can also uh, click that eye icon to turn the layers on and off. And you can also uh, change the base map, which I think is uh, really important because one of the base layers that this um, data portal provides is the NOAA nautical charts, which is uh, really useful to explore the position of these monitoring stations in relation 
to the Puerto Rican insular shelf and in relation to bathymetic features. So really, really useful base map right there. So you also see this uh, palette of colors. Uh, this is basically a range of values that you're given, that the given measurement you have selected is showing in, in the spatial scale by zooming in, colors are uh, adjusted to, to show what are the range of values in that in that um, spatial scale you're looking at. You'll see on the right panel, there are also several filters, drop down menus, right? So the first one is to choose the measurements that you want to visualize. The second one is to choose a larger species grouping, which you can choose from. Uh, and this divides the benthic sessile organisms from the fish, from the macro high vertebrates. And there's just a few sightings, very rare occasional sightings of turtles and mammals. Then uh, you can also select by common name, which is a way for you know more users to uh, have the opportunity to filter through and browse the data. I recommend that if you're gonna look for common name, first establish a species grouping filter, and that will narrow down your common names. For example, if you check if you check the fish, you'll only see the common names for different fish families uh, which is which are shown here in this drop down menu like angel fishes snappers groupers that which are um, groups of families at the taxonomic level right you can also uh, select the insular shelf zone and lastly for those of you who are uh, knowledgeable on taxonomy there's an advanced filter where you can choose specific taxa uh, following your taxonomic hierarchy right so for example, if we want to choose uh, corals, we can draw, uh, move through the filters, choosing the phylum Cnidaria, then moving down to Scleractinia, and then choosing specific families. Let's say uh, we want to look at the Orbicellas, so we choose Merulinidae, and then we find the Orbicellas, which are, for example, one of the frame, primary framework builders in Puerto Rican coral reefs. So that is one way you can uh, query the data by, by selecting your, your appropriate um, filters. Now, please uh, beware that when playing with the advanced taxonomic filter, you have to double check that the, the filters in the upper uh, side of, of the right panel, they coincide with what you're selecting. So if you're selecting corals and then up you have fish, there might be some errors in the way you visualize the data. So here uh, we're looking at specific stations. If you hover over a point, you'll see a pop-up window that will list what are the most abundant or the dominant species for that given measurement, for that given species, for a given time frame and spatial unit, right? So here we can see that in the Secheo Island, an area with high cover of Orbicella, there were values of around 19% um, cover. The same if you select fish, the filter, uh, the pop-up window updates and you'll see the fishes. Down here, you have a slide bar to select uh, the temporal or the, the time, right? The years that you want to look at the data. So for example, if we select only 2019, only stations with data in 2019 will be displayed. And for example, here you can Again, hover over that point and you'll see the list of dominant species for that site for that year. Finally, you have another slide bar, which is the depth. And for that, let's put the nautical charts. And you can see these three stations, which are sitting right in the shelf edge of the Western Puerto Rican shelf, right? This is uh, within the Tourmaline Marine Protected Area. And as you shift the slide bar for the depth filter, you can see how these stations begin to appear, right? Just to show you that you can also filter by depth. Finally, uh, when you click on a station, there will be another uh, window that appears with a bar chart, and you'll see uh, the values for that given species and measurement uh, for uh, uh, over the time period that you're selecting. You can change the the bar graph to a line plot uh, 
and just visualize potential temporal uh, variations in, in that station. So that is uh, kind of like the basic uh, features of the map. Now we're gonna move into a little bit, perhaps more complex feature that I think is really useful for data views, which is the data views, okay? So on the upper panel, if you select data views, you can click default and you'll see like this um, set of options that you can create by clicking that plus button, a new add data view, putting a view label, and just clicking add data view, and you'll see that, for example, here we created the peer cream demo benthic data view, okay? But right now it's empty. There's no data sets added to this data view. We just created it and labeled it peer cream demo benthic, right? So how can you then add the data? So um, if you move back to the map, make sure you have uh, the data of interest selected using your filters you can start selecting data creating polygons with this feature here on the on the left you can draw a polygon across individual stations or group of stations because really you don't need to draw a polygon for our individual stations you can just uh, select the station and here in the bar graph view you'll see a little blue star if you click there you can uh, add that uh, station or the polygon that you created to a specific data view. So there we just um, added that station to our peer print demo benthic data view. If we add another, it's the same. You went the polygon and just click there, add it to the demo benthic data view. And finally, let's add the deepest station here in Tour Marine just to compare how the coral cover changes over time across three different depths at the same um, marine protected area. Once the data, uh, the data sets are added, we go back to our data view and now we see that this uh, is populated. First of all, here in this little map, if we zoom in, we see again, we can confirm what polygons or what stations we have added and they're being labeled one, two, and three. We see that number one is the deepest site, is off in the shelf edge. Number two is in an intermediate depth and number three will be the shallow, right? So we can label each individual data set for, you know, with a label that um, is familiar to us. We can also change here these uh, graph ties from bars to, to line plots. And then we can click in these icons, add to compare chart, and this will add this, uh, these data sets to a composed graph where we can then compare how this time series um, change across the polygons or the, or the time that we are selecting. So in this case, we can see in Turmarin, for example, this is coral cover. And in 2005, we saw a dramatic decline in coral cover, but mostly in the shallowest station of Turmarin, which is here labeled as number three, and then the other, all three stations are kind of showing a gently uh, path towards recovery of coral cover. Really interesting, just to show um, the information that we can uh, potentially uh, uh, extract from these data views, selecting data subsets of our peer cream database. So now uh, I wanted to work around an uh, uh, example with the fish data. Again, you know already, you can create polygons with this uh, tool right there. And now let's compare how do fish uh, density compare between stations which are near the insular shelf edge versus stations which are close to shore. So for that, we can create this polygon for the outer shelf sites, right? Selecting all these stations which are out in the shelf edge of Puerto Rico and add it to a custom-made data view called peer cream fish demo. You can create whatever data view you want, but in this case, that's the label we use. And now we do a polygon for the inner shelf stations. We finish drawing this polygon by double-clicking it. The bar graph appears. You go again to the star, add it to your data view, and it's been added, right? 
Now we go to the data view of interest, the fish demo data view. Again, we see the map with our two polygons that we want to compare. And we have the, the individual data set graphs on the right panel. In these graphs, you can also change the, the temporal resolution or the temporal scale, or you can bin it by years, by two year, months, whatever is available in your data set, right? This will depend on, on the data sets that you're uh, uploading to always. So let's say, let's compare the last five years, the density of fish between these two polygons representing the shelf edge and the inner shelf, if you may. Remember that it's good uh, you can label your data sets to avoid confusion. We can label this then number two will be the outer shelf. And then click add to compare chart, right? And here we have an overlay graph for the for a five year period showing basically that the density of fish in the outer shelf more than doubles the density of fish in our inner shelf stations. So again, uh, this can be used to compare different MPAs and it can be a quick tool for data users and which can go from researchers all the way to the resource managers and decision makers or the recreational users of RISI in Puerto Rico who want to explore you know, what, what may be some patterns that this um, abstract data uh, may, may, may throw at them, right? So now, uh, if you wanna download the data, right? There's several ways you could do it. One of them is clicking on the layer directly. It will take you back to that metadata, metadata website. And here you can see the metadata URL where it, it will take you back to the National Center for Environmental Information Archive. Or in the data citation, you can click in that link that says source data. And it will take you actually to the data that the MBON visualization tool is pulling the data from. So in this case, the data is archived in GBIF. And that is actually the data that is that you're looking at in the map, the, the, the direct data, right? In this uh, side, you can check uh, what is what's the most uh, recent version of the data and download it from there. Also in the MBON portal, you can download the entire data set uh, under data citation, just go in there when it says downloads and you can download in various formats like shape files, CSV files, JSON, uh, for your for the platform of your preference, right? Also, you can query the data uh, by spatial scales, drawing polygons. And when you see that pop up coming up with the bar graph, there's a download button. And again, you can download as a CSV, shapefile, or JSON. So those are uh, two ways you can um, download the data. And remember, always pay attention to what you have selected in the filters they're in the right panels so you're downloading the right data and you're visualizing the right data the data that you're interested in. okay so what's next so one of the key things for these tools to meet uh, the user expectations is feedback so when you play around with this tool please know that in the upper right corner um, there is a feedback button and we've been already using it to fix some, some issues that we had. For example, sometimes when you're navigating uh, the map or when you were navigating the map because now it's fixed, um, the, the filter, the advanced filter uh, was empty all of a sudden. So I just click on that feedback um, button and I create basically like a ticket. A ticket. Uh, I just put, hey, I'm having this issue. Uh, if there's something we can do about it, you put your contact info and it already uh, goes into, into the MBOM people and the Axiom data, data science team so they can tackle and see what are some of the issues. And many times it could be something, uh, I guess, relatively easy <laughs> to fix, even though I'm really ignorant in that part because I, I, I personally don't work on 
on that end of the of the of the work but it's a it's a really important tool that we encourage you to use uh, submit your feedback if you think the scale is really off it doesn't make something doesn't make sense uh we can work a solution around either on my end which i'm working more on like the the biological and the monitoring uh information of the of the data set or in the, the action data science and which they're um spearheading the the programming and the development of this app another important step that we want to take is actually target data contributors people who may be uh owners or custodians of data sets for the caribbean because uh, uh, a really big goal that many stakeholders have mentioned through the decades really is to have a, a centralized platform or tool to visualize coral reef and marine coastal data in, in puerto rico and the caribbean so right now there's only one tool to visualize biological data in this way which uh, i'm really proud to say uh, the pr cream right now is the only uh, program of coral reef monitoring in puerto rico which is giving this option for users to look at data in a very granular uh, level of detail. But we know that uh, we live in a data rich environment. There's several monitoring projects going on uh, from government agencies, from NGOs, etc. And we would really like to uh, get, get you to um, work with us on uploading additional data sets to OBIS and hopefully having more layers in the Embo data portal that we can put on that on the same base map uh, for ease of access and ease of, of view. Some of these I would like to mention, uh, which we're targeting uh, to follow up and hopefully uh, include more layers. These include the NOAA Coral Reef Monitoring Program for Puerto Rico and the US Virgin Islands. There's uh, three years of monitoring data already, and these are fantastic data sets with a different uh, monitoring design than the peer cream that really complements information available on color bits for Puerto Rico. We also would like to target uh, the mesophotic reef characterizations that are uh, implemented by the Caribbean Fisheries and Management Council because mesophotic reefs here in Puerto Rico are really, really unknown, and these are really a, a outstanding field efforts to dive deep and get data on ecologically important habitats that are really uh, we know very little about. So uh, there's a data set there that we really would like to target. There's uh, the Coral Reef Resilience Assessment, which was a synthesized product from this peer current database that provides information on what then may be the capacity of our reefs to uh, recover from previous disturbances. Also, uh, CMAP fisheries data, which is a huge fisheries independent data that the DRNA has been collecting for almost, I think, 20 years or more. And also in the USBI, which I would really like to know what other data sets are available, but I know about the Territorial uh, Coral Reef Monitoring Program or TCREM, which uh, they have a really nice uh, work going on there. Uh, with many, many stations around, and that would be really neat to have as well as a layer in, in a map. Others, well, we're open to suggestions and we're open to collaborations. So uh, we hope that the peer grant could be as a spearhead to or a proof of concept in, in Puerto Rico and, and other places in the Caribbean to show that biological monitoring data can be visualized. And we have support uh, from MBON that uh, could, get, could facilitate having additional layers in, in this tool. With that, I will give you thanks for your attention. Thanks a lot. And now, if you have any questions uh, or comments, uh, let's open the discussion. <laughs>